One of the main reasons for producing this armchair tour of the Magilaw Maritime Museum was simply because the building has some difficulties attached to it. For example, the upper deck of the building has an external stair, which is not accessible by any other means. So if someone with a disability or someone with mobility problems wishes to visit the museum, we felt we had to find ways to make that more accessible and so the idea of the armchair tour came about. Someone can come to the lower area of the museum, they can access the computer there and then they can have this guided tour both of upstairs and downstairs of the museum trying to help people maximise their visitor experience. As we enter the upstairs area, it is a brightly lit area looking out through a bay window to the wild north sea beyond, across the old slipway, the gutty, and into the harbour area, part of which was designed by Thomas Telford. The area is small, but we've attempted to maximise it by the use of interpretive panels and scrapbooks and also computers which would help people take more information or just simply browse through the scrapbooks and cuttings or stroll round the interpretive panels to get the basic story of some exciting events that have Gordon at their centre. The first panel as you enter the door on the right hand side is a panel dedicated to James James Mowat, the boat builder from Gordon, who in his career built over 200 boats in that yard along beside the railway cutting just north from the museum itself. Of course, the most famous boat was the one he built for the fishermen of Gurdon, commissioned by them, called the Maggie Law. And it got its name from the daughter of a fish curer called Tom Law. And so the boat was christened the Maggie Law and that is the centrepiece of the downstairs area of the museum. The next panel tells the story of Hercules Linton, the designer of the Cutty Sark. He served his apprenticeship with Hall, the boat builders in Aberdeen, and went on to design the first composite ship of steel and wood. This ship was built at the yard in Dumbarton and was called the Cutty Sark, taken from the famous poem Tam O'Shanter by Robert Burns, where Tam of an evening where drink had been taken, was coming back through the kirkyard at Old Alloway and came upon warlocks and witches in a dance and in a moment of madness shouted out, Well done, Cutty Sark. A little known fact is that Hercules Linton from Inverbervie actually commissioned James Mowat of Gordon to build two boats for him and he personally supervised them himself. And so we have this wonderful connection with the world-famous name of the Cutty Sark and the very famous local name of the Maggie Law. The next panel along tells us a little bit about the Gordon fleet. And this is a work in progress. On this panel are listed the number of boats that we could identify from the boat stamps for fish sales from the Gordon Fishermen's Association. Of course, we know this list is incomplete, but this is where we want visitors to help us help the museum. And so, a specific book has been designed, as well as a page on the website, where anyone who comes along, who knows the name of a boat, or the skipper of a boat, or the registration of a boat, which is not listed on this panel, enters it into the book and we eventually upgrade the panel so that we will someday have the most comprehensive record of the Gordon fleet from past right up to the present day. The next panel along tells a wonderful story of Gordon and the First World War. In 1916, a boat called the Bella sailed from Gordon, sailed northward for line fishing. This boat, with its six of a crew, were fishing off Catterline Bay when a German U-boat surfaced and took them on board and blew the Bella to smithereens. The six men were taken off to Germany as prisoners of war and worked in a forestry camp. When they returned to Gurdon, the skipper of the boat, Andrew Ritchie, bought himself another boat 
and I'm so delighted at being back in his native garden, he called the boat the Happy Return. And a wonderful model of that boat can be seen in the downstairs part of the museum, where it has pride of place today. A great story, which tells how you know a world war impacted on such small communities as Gordon. The next panel along tells an even more remarkable story about John Kergill. John Kergill was a Gordon man. He joined the Navy and he served on board the Carpathia. And as you know, the Carpathia was the cruise ship which went to the rescue of the Titanic on that fateful night. John, or Serge as he was known locally, was part of the crew who rescued over 400 people from the lifeboats of the Titanic on that dreadful night. In an interview, John tells of that night, where they were lowering coal sacks down the side of the cruise ship, the Carpathia, to the lifeboats, and the women and men in the lifeboats were placing children in these coal sacks and hauling them up to safety. Thanks to John and the crew of the Carpathia, they saved over 400 lives. Nothing, I would say, in relation to the lives that were lost that night, but that's another story. And if anyone wants more information about any of these stories, this whole area upstairs has links to various websites where you can go to other fisheries museums and expand your knowledge of any particular aspect of anything you see in the museum today. The last panel on the right-hand side of the upstairs of the museum is dedicated to the Gordon lifeboats. It lists the names of the lifeboats until their decommissioning in the 1960s and it lists the crew, the skippers and there is a wonderful book written by Roy Souter which actually details all the call-outs, the payments made and the hardships and the rescues of these wonderful men of Gordon who gave selflessly of themselves for the safety of others. The record of the lifeboat call-outs, the, the boards on which names and boats were recorded, are now held for safekeeping in the local village hall and can be accessed by asking for the key from the hall keeper who lives right next door. So we then come to the gable wall facing us. The gable wall has two maritime pictures which really are at the heart of Gordon. On the one side is a man called Alec Welsh, seen red in the lines, ready to go to sea. And Alec is the father of Douglas Welsh and uh, Sandy Welsh of Gordon, who were fishermen in their own right and have some great stories to tell. To the right of this picture is a picture of a skipper called Peter Morrison. And Peter is shown in this photograph standing alongside a halibut which weighs 16 stone and which is larger than him, hanging from the jib of a crane at the side of the harbour. So this gives a great insight into the past in terms of fishing and the working harbour of Gordon. There is a plasma screen and television situated on this gable wall as well, so that Presentations can be given about seabirds, about maritime rescue, about any topic related to the rich maritime heritage of Gordon and the Concordanshire coast. Coming from that gable wall up the left hand side of the museum are six working areas for pupils or students or researchers to use, equipped with computers, printers, screens, etc broken up at one point by the bay window which looks out over the old slipway, the gutty, right out to the North Sea, and placed on that area is a powerful telescope so that people can make more of the area, the sea, the shipping as it goes past on any given day. Returning to the entrance of the museum on the upper deck, we have an interpretive panel called the Lost Villages. This panel depicts four villages along our coastline which have disappeared or were once regarded as key fishing settlements along our coast. 
The first one we come to if we were going north from Gurdon would be an inlet called Little John's Haven, which was a salmon bothy and has one cottage in a working area. Beyond that, the next village and settlement was called Shield Hill, a very important fishing settlement, and many people today from Gordon and around had ancestors who were born and lived and worked at Shield Hill. Shield Hill sits just below the picturesque Old Kirk of Kenef. North of Kenef, between Braden Bay and Toddhead Lighthouse, lie the remains of an early fishing settlement. In old maps and in folklore, this village has been known by various names. Gopul, Gopal, Gap Hill, Gapal, being just a few, giving reference to this old fishing settlement. Whatever the proper pronunciation, the story behind the demise of the village as a lost village is extremely interesting. It is suggested that in the 1750s, this village was populated by 40 people living together as a fishing community with 12 men manning two boats fishing out of Braden Bay. One evening, the press gang, in their search for men to press gang into the British Navy, descended on the village and took away the 12 men leaving the women and children with no other option but to move away to find work and means of sustaining themselves in the surrounding areas of Ochenblay and Inverbervie. Further north, going past the village of Catterline to a village called Croton. Croton today is a thriving residential area, still a small village, but it still holds the picturesque remains of some of the old fishermen's cottages. Shield Hill was seen as one of the boundary points for fishing along our coastline and from Croton to Shield Hill was seen as the area which was profitable for all the villages to work in and to cooperate with along the stretch of that coastline. The idea behind the Lost Villages project was to work in partnership with the Old Kirk at Kenef to see if we could actually lay down some of the heritage of these lost villages and show how the relationship between fishing, farming and the kirk work together for the benefit of all. A display is available in the old kirk at Kenef which highlights some of the views and some of the routes to these lost settlements on the Kincardenshire coast. One interesting feature along the wall of the museum on the upper deck is an outline of the coastline which stretches from Cowie outside Stonehaven down to St Cyrus with every possible area that we are aware of being marked. However, since this map was produced many locals have asked why a particular area has not been mentioned quite simply because we could not find it on any map but what we are doing, the same as with the fishing fleet, is we are noting all these different areas and this map will be upgraded. What this map does is provides a reference to all the significant villages and historic events along the coastline from Cowie at Stonehaven to St Cyrus on the border of Angus. Since the opening of the museum, Several interesting exhibits and artefacts have been handed in. One query led to a search for a knitting machine which had been handed in by a family when the museum originally opened in 1997. This machine was a circular knitting machine used for the manufacture of sea boot stockings. This was used by Andrew Freeman who produced many many pairs of these sea boot stockings for the fishermen of Gordon. It's hoped that this machine can be brought back into use and that demonstrations for pupils and visitors can be given on this machine producing these stockings. A further hope might be that if we can find someone with the local expertise and skill, it may well be that we can actually produce sea boot stockings for sale to raise funds for the Maggie Law Maritime Museum. 
As we finish our tour of the upper deck of the museum, we have a display case which holds a wide range of navigational instruments, items associated with the manufacture and repair of fishing lines and nets, and a range of other exhibits associated with fishing past and present in this working harbour of Gordon.